Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to another Great Varieties on Pinotage. This is our advanced version. So this is ideal for those of you that are studying your WSET level 3 or above. If you are studying your level 3, there's a lot of information in this which will be above your pay grade. You won't need to know it so much, but it does give you that extra little bit of curricular activity. It kind of immerses you in the subject a bit more. Those of you studying WSET Level 4 Diploma and Equivalents will find this remarkably uh, fascinating and very useful, hopefully. So, uh, yes, without further ado, um, if you are looking for a more basic version, please do check out our Intermediate Level 1, which is ideal for WSET Level 2. So I mentioned my name is Jimmy Smith, uh, at Wine with Jimmy on Instagram and Twitter. Please get in touch for any comments or questions. I am the owner of West London Wine School in Fulham, London, United Kingdom, South London Wine School in Streatham and Greenwich in South London, in London, United Kingdom, and also Streatham Wine House, which is, of course, in Streatham in South London, a real great fun place to come and taste a lot of wines it's a real real great wine bar so please when you're in london next please come and see us for a class or a glass so um without further ado let's go through pinotage and we're going to go through pinotage first of all it's history then what it's like in the vineyard then what it's like in the winery uh, and how we affect it and then also then its uh, location uh, the kind of styles it produces, and that will finish us up. So let's go through the history first of all. Pinotage. Now, it is South African, we know this. It was created by uh, a chap called Abraham Isaac Perron, uh, and this was in 1925, 1926, at a place called the Welgevelen Experimental Farm, which is on the grounds of Stellenbosch University, the University of Stellenbosch, in fact. Um, so uh, it was created... Um, really uh, really to start sort of looking at a variety, to produce a variety which would be quite suitable to the warm and dry conditions of South Africa because the parent varieties we'll go through in a second are quite useful for that. Um, so here we go, Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is a variety which is a struggle or has been in the past a struggle in many parts of South Africa. Now crossing it with Sanso, which in those days in the 1920s was called Hermitage, so Sanso is a remarkably um, hardy vine, very good vine at uh, uh, drought resistance, um, dry conditions, and it survives very well. So that means that uh, you really are crossing um, this vine, which will do well in South Africa's climate with Pinot Noir, which is a well adored, loved variety producing elegant and classy wines around the world. So it's trying to create this kind of balancing point between these two parent varieties. Um, now, uh, Abraham Perrold, uh, he um, was then signed up to KWV, the cooperative, which was just gaining huge emphasis in the, in the late 1920s. It was uh, extended its monopoly on the industry in 1924. Uh, and of course, really, if you wanted to be a scientist within uh, an organization in South Africa, that would be the way to go. So he joined KWV based in PAL in 1927. So really the year, year and a half of, uh, of these seedlings being produced for Pinotage, they were actually forgotten. He left them and they were uh, probably looked after by uh, other people within the estate um, at Stellenbosch University. Those seedlings were rescued by a man called Charlie Niehaus, who grafted the roots onto rootstocks at Welgevelen uh, and um, realized that there probably some potential here. And then Perold joined a little bit later, and those two together came up with the name Pinotage, of course, taking Pinot from Pinot Noir and Arge from Hermitage, which was the uh, mistaken name of Sanso in South Africa at that time. Um, now, the first commercial plantings after those were planted uh, in nursery blocks and then mother blocks and then uh, available to the market. The first commercial planting was at Myrtle Grove Farm in 1941 and also around the same time, Paul Sauer and Danny Rousseff uh, at Cannoncop um, planted them as well. Very important moment in time because Cannoncop are seen as the kind of custodians and, and the kind of godfathers of, of the grape 
Pinotage making some wonderfully complex, low yielding, carefully made, powerful Pinotages that can age very, very well. Uh, so uh, very important. And now we're looking at a sort of 80 years of history behind that now with some very old vines in play. Um, the first name that appeared on bottle was in 1961 on Lanzarax 1959 vintage. So in terms of labeling, we're looking at about 60 years of history. In the vineyard, of course, Pinotage is exclusively in South Africa. Now, I said almost there on the slide because you will find small, tiny pockets in places like Brazil and uh, New Zealand and uh, and so on and, and Zimbabwe even and so on. So there are other little bits everywhere, but really 99.99% is found in, uh, in South Africa. That is the major area. Um, it is adaptable to quite a lot of climates. We've uh, found this out quite a lot recently because Pinotage was initially thought to be really only for the central Western Cape areas, um, the areas like Pahl, uh, for instance, and parts of Stellenbosch, but it has started to be planted um, in coastal zones around False Bay, down towards Hemelanada. Um, Southern right are making quite an interesting Pinotage at the base of, of, of the Hemelanada Valley. So therefore, we do actually know that it's actually quite adaptable to moderated climates and cooler climates as well. And that will be its Pinot Noir part of its heritage. But it is also suited to warm and dry conditions, and that is its Sanso part of its heritage, which is a, a variety which is very hardy and very drought resistant. Um, it's uh, quite early um, budding and uh, quite early ripening uh, as well. Uh, so it ripens quite nicely. That's the Pinot Noir side of things again in this variety um, and frost isn't an issue as much in South Africa of course so this variety doesn't run that risk. As mentioned it is hardy that is certainly a characteristic which has been genetically passed down from Sanso it's moderately vigorous and productive, but these two things can be dramatically increased uh, when we're looking about um, you know, certain rootstocks in play, certain fertility, uh, and certain uh, certain soils, and, and you know bigger productions. You will find that there are some vineyards that can easily um, churn out around 120 hectoliters per hectare. Some of the much more um, higher end ones will be well below half of that number. Um, there are there are some susceptibility to mildews like powdery and downy, botrytis bunch rot as well. Um, not all too a bigger issue in South Africa. Uh, and they do tend to say that some of the better areas on those on hillsides with some water retention, not a huge amount, because as it says here that a lot of uh, uh, a little bit of water stress, uh, and then a fair lot of canopy management, including bunch thinning and green harvesting, will increase the intensity in the grapes on the remaining uh, uh, the remaining grapes on the vines, and that creates the more sort of powerful styles, which are the ones that tend to be made as quite complex varietal wines. Um, so, so yes, and you've got to be careful with that water stress. It is said that water, too much water stress around harvest creates uh, more of the acetone characteristic, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, also some pickers, certainly the newer breed and the younger winemakers across South Africa are looking at Pinotage being picked a little bit earlier to really create fresher, brighter wines that are a little bit more Pinot-esque or even like Sanso when it's picked early. So those kind of fresh, fruity, floral expressions and there's some wonderful expressions of those being made. In the winery, Pinotage, um, as mentioned, will be uh, fermented and will be matured and bottled as a single varietal. Cannon Cop, famous for this, but there are others. Um, but it could be blended. And um, if you've come through and done your WSET level two, all you need to know about really about Pinotage are that it's, that it's found in these Cape blends, these Western Cape blends and these are with Shiraz and Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and tend to be quite high volume, quite simple and of course Pinotage will make a part of that blend but it won't be the whole picture. Um, now there is um, one thing which Pinotage uh, really can have as a wine in quite 
um, noticeable amounts. And this is something which creates the Marmite effect with penitage. Some people hate it, some people love it. Um, and this is something which is called isomal acetate. And this is the acetic characteristic, the acetone characteristic, uh, which is linked to the volatile acids. And this may be that there are very hot ferments where the temperatures rise really intensively, 35 towards 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, and these quick hot ferments create this kind of uh, acetone characteristic, which gives us reminiscent characters like tar, a bitumen, um, a nail polish, paint, creosote. Um, but this has also sometimes been attributed to quite high temperatures at harvest time. Uh, grapes being harvested around Wellington down towards Robertson and Worcester, um, you know, coming in at uh, harvest time can be exceedingly high temperatures, 35 degrees Celsius quite easily. Uh, and these are also conditions which are said to increase that kind of isomer acetate characteristic. Um, so interesting notes around it. Some people are really off put by this and see it as a fault. Um, but they can be reduced by careful uh, grape growing as well as winemaking. So um, understanding your harvest time, but winemaking, cooler ferments, um, you know, and, and temperature control. But also then also there's, there's been a bit more kind of clonal diversity in the last 100 years of pinotage and selecting clones which are less intensive with these uh, isomal acetate characteristics. Um, also another way though, which has been a bit of a short term approach and quite a quick fix is actually, if you do have these characteristics and you know they're quite inherent of your house style of pinotage or pinotage blends, uh, this is to use barrels which have been quite heavily toasted on the inside. Uh, so a medium plus or pronounced toast. Now putting your pinotage within these barrels will quite intensively increase uh, a chocolate mocha coffee characteristic, uh, which is quite noticeable and has actually bred and born quite a interesting movement in South Africa, kind of often called the barista movement of these coffee chocolate pinotages. And you'll see many labeled like this. There is the barista pinotage. There is uh, things like chocolate block, which has pinotage in it. There is uh, things like um, uh, Starbucks peanut. No, that last one's a joke. But so there are certainly uh, are quite a few of these um, these styles uh, in play. Now, if you want to taste the wine for the wine, the grapes, this might annoy you that you're tasting this kind of just chocolate characteristic. But some people love it. Some people will like these characteristics. So where do we find it? Of course, it is massively in South Africa, 99.9%. Um, 6,800 hectares are found in South Africa, um, about 7.5% 7, 7 of their total production. It's found, of course, in those Western Cape blends, but really some of the most significant plantations will be in the southern Svartland around Malmesbury. Uh, Stellenbosch, uh, which is a little bit more below that, around Somerset West and Stellenbosch, and then up towards Pal, which is sandwiched between those two. Uh, so, yeah, there is stuff in Worcester and Robertson and Klein Karoo as well. So there's a fair bit of it found all over the shop. Um, so, yes. What about its style? So we know that the parents to Pinot Noir and Sanso both very dominated with red fruits. So cherries, strawberries, raspberries and red plum is common with a Pinotage. They tend to be uh, often a little bit sweeter, um, maybe cocktail cherries, maybe something like uh, Kirsch or Chambord, so liqueur or even jammy due to the warm and dry conditions out here. Um, also, there is some spice sometimes, black pepper licorice, you'll see that at the top here, smokiness, certainly from oak, uh, uh, coffee and chocolate, depending on the oak as well. Um, new oak and heavily toasted, as mentioned, will increase these flavor compounds. Uh, the big chunk of charcoal here is to depict tar, which will be linked to the acetone character. You'll often find either limiting amounts, small amounts of this tarry, charcoaly bitumen, um, creosote paint, uh, acetone note, which could actually be a benefit in small amounts. But in some instances, it is a very dominating factor and can be a little bit too much. Uh, so that is really it. Um, the, the tannins tend to be kind of on the moderate side of life. The acidities tend to be high. Uh, but it is a wine of a distinctive character, purely 
uh, from South Africa, originally from South Africa, nearly purely from South Africa today. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed your session on Pinotage. So I've been Jimmy Smith at Wine with Jimmy. Thank you so much for your time and, and watching this video. Uh, at West London Wine, at South London Wine are the two wine schools. At Streatham Wine House is that wine bar down in South London. Please come and see us for a class or a glass when you're in London next. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for watching.